Hi, with me today is um, Francesca Rizzi, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO of Superfluid. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, to kick off the conversation, I'll ask a few questions about you. And uh, the first question is, when and how were you first exposed to crypto? So I think it was 2017, at the beginning of the year. Um, I, met a, I met this Russian guy in a startup uh, meetup, and he started telling me about prediction markets. Mm -hmm. So my first exposure was uh, basically through this kind of very interesting product, you know, it, economic incentives, mechanism design, and that got me pretty interested. And then after that, I started reading more and eventually, you know, how it goes for everyone. But uh, were you immediately hooked or did it uh, take a while for you to really understand what crypto is and, uh, and so? It definitely took me a while to understand everything, uh, but it got me hooked on the idea that we can, uh, we can build systems and mechanisms to make things happen through economic means, which is something I never thought about before. Mm -hmm. And then that took me further down the rabbit hole. And I was lucky I was exposed to uh, more technical people early on, which led me down a, a path that wasn't trading. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I ended up learning more kind of the mechanisms rather than the trading side. And I think that uh, that took me here where I am. OK, now. cool. And uh, what's uh, the craziest thing you've ever done or experienced in crypto? So probably this must have been when I when I pretty much just started uh, working in crypto on my first job. I was working at a startup and one of the founders had an accident. So I had to step in for him at a conference. Mm -hmm. So from one day to the next, I flew to Singapore mm -hmm. and I was on the blockchain cruise. And in the blockchain cruise, I met a lot of crazy people. I just joined crypto, right? So everybody was crazy, right? There were people singing Bitcoin songs. There was John McAfee, which was completely high the whole time. So that was kind of my first impact uh, with the industry. And uh, I loved it. So. Mm. Cool. What's your biggest joy and your biggest uh, disappointment in crypto? I'd say my biggest joy in crypto is the community that we've managed to create, both uh, in the broader crypto ecosystem, in DeFi specifically, and then in Superfluid specifically, right, in, in my company. I think uh, you can really sense that crypto manages to attract really smart people that want to fix really hard problems with really creative solutions, right? And these are the people that I'd love to be around. So I, I'd say that's my, my main... Uh, joy and the reason I, I always you know wake up happy to to work in terms of disappointment i mean i guess maybe the fact that we haven't managed to integrate uh, superfluid with one inch is quite <laughs> disappointing but i think we can fix that yeah i hope so too <laughs> now let's move to questions about superfluid when was it founded uh we started superfluid i guess two and a half years ago more mm -hmm. or less do you have any any story from the uh, from the beginning of your company? Something I don't know. Uh, how many how many of you were at the beginning? So it was three of us. Uh, mm -hmm. We we came up with the idea in East Berlin. We uh, started talking. Every, we all dropped our jobs and we all decided that this was what we were going to do. Even though you know it was crazy and everybody told us we were crazy and it was still the bear market. So. Whatever we said, nobody believed, and uh, it sounded stupid. But we decided that this was too big to ignore. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was exciting times. It was very hard at the time to get investors interested. It was very hard to get people interested. But we pushed forward, and then obviously bull market started, so everything changed. Uh, your website says that uh, the project's mission is uh, basically to, if I if I remember it correctly, to change uh, the way assets move in the centralized space. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, of course. So Superfluid is a protocol which allows you to stream money. But obviously, I say money, but it could be any token, right? Any asset in, uh, in DeFi. So streaming is, is effectively a completely new way of moving money, right? Normally, we are used to moving money in lump sums, right? So mm -hmm. I'll transfer $100 now. With streaming, you can do this different thing, which is 
I'll transfer one cent of a dollar every second, right? So mm -hmm. it's literally a different way of using and thinking about money. Um, so yeah, we think that using this new primitive, there's a lot of uh, new applications that can be built in DeFi. Uh, so yeah, that's what we mean on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, if uh, we try to look a little bit into the future, these uh, streams of value, uh, I, s I think uh, currently it's just a tiny proportion, but five years uh, from now, what do you think, uh, what proportion of all these uh, streams of value could be handled uh, via DeFi? So I'd start from the use cases, right? Mm -hmm. So the main use cases for Superfluid are uh, slightly more commercial, right? So things like paying subscriptions, paying salaries, paying rentals. And I think these use cases have to grow if DeFi is to mature, mm -hmm. right? If you look at traditional finance, it's not all about trading and it's not all about leverage, right? There's a very big component, which is about mortgages, lending to businesses, borrowing, rentals. And these are all use cases, which so far we have not seen in DeFi. Mm -hmm. So I think bringing these use cases is a huge opportunity. And obviously, you know, we're onboarding more and more people into our ecosystem. So I feel in five years, I hope, right, I, as I said, if the industry matures, this should be a significant part of uh, the ecosystem. I can't say how much, but uh, I hope we, we manage to bring this more diversity of use cases to DeFi. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, switching gear, let's move to questions uh, about uh, the crypto space in general. We are talking just a few weeks after the Terra Luna collapse. What impact uh, do you think uh, this is having and is uh, going to have on the crypto space? Is there any silver lining? Well, it's, it's been very painful for a lot of people. Uh, personally, I know a lot of people who have lost a lot of money and it's never easy, right, when you lose money because ultimately money is a safety net, right? We save money so when something goes wrong, we're okay. So a lot of people now feel very vulnerable. Um, and this fragility is very damaging to the industry because ultimately people are happy when number goes up, but when number disappears, people feel destroyed. Right? Okay. And I think it was very, very, um, it was very damaging what happened, but it's also inevitable, right? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're growing pains. As much as they are very big pains, they're still growing pains. Our industry has a long way to go. And uh, we shouldn't let this scare us away from the broader mission of bringing financial freedom to everyone in the world. So we're gonna keep building, right? There's nothing else we, we can do really. Um, but I understand that a lot of people might be thinking that uh, you know crypto is not for them right and what i would say to those people is to you know take their time maybe stay away but eventually if they came once and we provided value to them once we will provide it to them again and it's up to us to prove that not all of the industry works like that right and we do that by building things that are useful and make people's lives better and uh, all we can do to get those people back, to win them back into the industry, is to keep building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. What's your take on the future of Bitcoin? Is it uh, going to stay pretty much a store of value or could it become a full-fledged means of payment? Honestly, I find Bitcoin quite boring. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't been following it for a while. Um, I think a lot of people are overly invested and as a result fail to see its shortcomings. I don't think it will become a means of payment. Uh, I think as a store of value, the meme is, is quite strong and it's a valuable meme for a lot of people, especially in you know, inflation-ridden countries. And it, you know, it's definitely better than gold, right? So if there's been a room for gold in a very you know, evolved economy, there's still people who buy gold, then I think even as Ethereum and DeFi and the kind of broader crypto ecosystem becomes much bigger than Bitcoin, 
Bitcoin is still going to be there the same way gold is there in traditional finance. But it won't, it won't uh, be technologically very interesting. And in fact, uh, I, would, I would say that it should try and be even more boring in order to be uh, better gold. <laughs> yeah. What, is, uh, you, <coughs> what do you think about anonymity in crypto? Because opinion, opinions uh, differ, some think it is good, other people think it's not good and it's, it leads to all kinds of nefarious and criminal activities. What do you think about it? Um, I think anonymity is extremely important. If you, if you think about it, there, there are a lot of uh, examples in history about people who published articles, published books, uh, you know, wrote manifestos using pseudon pseudonyms, right? They couldn't disclose their identity. They had to do it um, using a false identity, right? Now, people who think anonymity is not important don't understand that customs and rules and regulations change over time and that challenging those by being anonymous is the way that we change those customs, right? Uh, people who were uh, publishing anonymously in the 1800s were women, right? Should women not be able to publish? Should have that been illegal? Well, that's what changed society, right? So I think anonymity, similarly in, in crypto, is important because it allows people who are, for example, targeted by their governments to escape from those governments, right? And escaping from a bad government should be something that all of us defend and protect, right? So I feel anonymity is important. Uh, I understand that there's always going to be people fighting it because it's always going to be a fight, but uh, I think it's a fight worth uh, fighting. Mm -hmm. Now I want to ask you about crypto regulation. A lot of countries are trying to introduce some kind of regulation or tighten the existing rules what uh, would uh, uh, ideal crypto uh, regulation be like? So I think, I think there's a lot of different aspects uh, of life that are touched by regulation, right? And in crypto is the same. There's a lot of different, you know, you have securities laws, tax laws, employment laws, commercial laws, and all of these impacts uh, the crypto industry, but also any other industry in different ways. And ultimately, unfortunately, regulators often think that they know what they're doing, right? But realistically, they should mostly focus on um, protecting outcomes rather than prescribing ways, right? So mm -hmm. if a regulator tells you how to do something, the inevitable outcome is that whatever rule they make is going to be obsolete very soon because technology keeps changing. So I think the best regulation is regulation which is not prescriptive, is agnostic to technology, and tries to basically leave as much freedom as possible for technology to evolve while, uh, if necessary, and only when necessary, creating protections for consumers or investors. But at the same time, I feel providing protection to investors has mostly turned into keeping investors away from making money and keeping rich people uh, being the only ones able to make more money, right? So ultimately, I've seen regulation fail more times than it's been helpful in uh, the crypto space. So I just hope regulators are able to look beyond um, what their close advisors say and look into the industry and really talk to people who you know, live and breathe crypto every day, because those are the people who know what they're talking about. Uh -huh. Now, my next question <coughs> is uh, about metaverse. It's quite a buzzword. What's, uh, what's your definition of metaverse? My definition of the metaverse? Um, I guess I like the definition which is that the metaverse is that state of mind where your digital life is more important than your physical life, right? And I think that's the case for a lot of people in newer generations, 
Uh, I think in my mind, I still like the physical world, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't associate it with VR or anything like that. Like, for example, I don't think I'll ever spend any significant amount of time in VR, but I do spend a lot of time on Twitter, on mm -hmm. Discord, on Slack, on Telegram, on Zoom calls, right? And that is most of my life, right? So I think that is what we mean by metaverse. It's uh, literally the fact that the digital experiences are uh, more important to us than the physical ones. And as a result, uh, obviously, this changes our behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, before wrapping up, uh, I'd like to ask you about mass adoption of crypto. Uh, do you think we need some kind of a killer app to take it to a new level? Or can it be just, can it be just a gradual process? That's a very good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think we're going to see a number of killer apps. I think we're going to see a number of different even uh, verticals and industries that bring a lot of adoption. So for example, NFTs, right? The more media uh, engagement, fun part has brought a lot of adoption. Uh, money, right? Bitcoin, but also stable coins have brought a lot of adoption. And those are completely different use cases with completely different uh, audiences. And then there's a third one, which is gaming, right? Gaming has brought, a, again, a completely different audience from uh, even, uh, you know, third world countries often joining play to earn uh, ecosystems, right? So I think these are kind of the three main um, uh, audiences that we're seeing right now. And if we're seeing three audiences right now, there's likely a lot more that we're leaving out. So I think rather than one killer app, it's a, a combination of a, a growing ecosystem and a growing network effects around that ecosystem that will ultimately onboard uh, more and more people in an exponential way, right? One thing I do think is missing in crypto and is, in my opinion, a very important uh, catalyst is commercial adoption. There's really not that many um, projects, uh, businesses, that are working on business adoption, especially small business, right? There's people working with corporates, there's people working with financial institutions, but nobody is trying to onboard small business. And actually, I think small business is where a lot of the DeFi tools that we're building can be very useful because traditionally banks also underserve small businesses, right? Well, with a smaller OPEX, we can actually do a lot in crypto for small businesses. Nobody's working on that. And I think uh, that's a very big opportunity that nobody has managed to find a killer app for. Um, so, I mean, obviously at Superfluid, it's kind of related to what we do, but uh, I think that is one aspect where there's a lot of opportunity still. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks, Francesco, for your insights. Thank yeah, you. thanks a lot. It was lots of fun. <laughs>